So on a spring Sunday evening, 2000 years ago, uh, a man walks into a room where the people were so terrified that they had locked themselves in. Uh, He says to them a common enough greeting of the time, peace be with you. But we think actually this man was never casual with his words. So we think he is wishing peace where there is currently terror. And he shows them his hands and his side. Who was this man? This man was the Lord Jesus. Uh, Their friend Jesus, who on the previous Friday was unquestionably dead. Today, he was the most alive man on the planet. Uh, And instantly, their fears were not merely blunted. Uh, Their terrors were not slightly calmed. Their fear was replaced by joy. Uh, In fact, our gospel writer who would have been in that room tells us that they would have been, sorry, that they were overjoyed. What would you give to have that experience? Uh, Whatever is worrying you, whatever is playing on your mind, may be causing you sleepless nights at the moment. What would you give to have your mind utterly put at ease? No, no, no. Even more than that, what would you give to know the Bible's word is joy despite what is happening in your life or despite what you fear will happen in your life. Forgive me, just let me, please allow me just to be real and very raw for a second. Uh, Sometimes I think we, we think church ought to be this bubble and we leave everything outside and we come into this sort of happy bubble. Um, No, church isn't a happy bubble. Church is not where we leave all our worries outside. Church is where we bring them inside to see them in a new light, to see them in God's light. So your marriage that feels lifeless or worse. Uh, your, Your children maybe now grown up, who are just making unwise decisions. That the person in your family or your workplace or even our church or on the world stage who you just think is out of control. Your online gambling, which is almost in control. Uh, And your Christian life, which from time to time just makes you feel fraudulent. Uh, And then there's death. Not so much, I can say this at my age, not so much when death threatens me, but when it threatens someone I love. What would you give in respect of these and many other matters to have a mind at ease this Easter morning? 2,000 years ago, the resurrection of Jesus changed the way the disciples viewed their own lives. 2,000 years ago, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus changed the, changed the way the disciples viewed everything. And 2,000 years later, it is God's very great purpose to continue his work of changing the way we see everything. Sorry, that's a long introduction, but just to help us understand those Easter events, I want us to look at that, uh, just a part of a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples on the Thursday, which was even before he was arrested. Uh, And my first heading uh, is indescribable turmoil. Uh, Jesus is having supper with his disciples for the last time before his death. And he says to them, chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Uh, And that word heart in the Bible isn't like today's usage of the word heart, which is basically our, our emotions. No, it isn't as though the disciples were having an off day. It wasn't as though they were merely feeling low. The heart in the Bible is a picture of the very core of our being. 
So it's not just our feelings. It was seen as the place of our thinking, the place of our values, the place of our character identity. That the heart in the Bible is the the heart, (laughs) that the very centre, the very essence of who I am. So the disciples had troubled hearts. They were in turmoil. They were beside themselves with worry. They were, they were barely functioning because of their worry. Because the Lord Jesus, the person they had invested their lives in, was leaving. Uh, each year I take a week to help lead an Oak Hall holiday expedition. Brochures on the back chest. And last summer I was in, I was in Italy. I sat next to this um, very lovely girl at supper one evening. I guess she was mid-twenties. Uh, and I asked her about her life. And I learned that she lived in London. And uh, I knew the church she used to go to. And I knew a bit about the church she currently went to. Uh, and suddenly she started to cry. A year ago I was engaged, she said. And the relationship with the guy that she had loved, the relationship with the guy she had invested everything in, was over. The disciples, they had given up everything to follow Jesus, and now he was leaving. Now what were they supposed to do? That They were losing him. But they were not losing the hostility of others towards him. They would continue to face that, but without him. Have they got Jesus totally wrong? Was Jesus not the person they thought he was? But they loved this guy and they had some inkling of the nightmare that would unfold over the next 18 hours. The the, the disciples... The disciples, I, you know, I, I, as I was writing this, I couldn't even think of a word. The disciples were in indescribable turmoil. And so Jesus says to them, in fact, Jesus commands them, he says, I'm going, you must trust me. I'm going, you must trust me. Uh, chapter 14, verse 1, you believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, you can trust me because I am God. You, you trust God. You, you must trust me. Uh, right at the beginning of his gospel, this passage so familiar to us, John talks about the word. A word, a word is something that conveys truth. And John calls Jesus the word, someone who is absolute truth, someone who speaks absolute truth. In the beginning was the word, Jesus, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I'm going, you must trust me. Firstly, you must trust me because I'm the God who made the universe, who once in eternity has come down to live amongst you. But secondly, you must trust me because I do know what I'm doing. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Trust me, because all you can see is my departure. All you can see is a bleak future. But trust me, because I am going for a good purpose. Trust me, because I'm going to go and prepare an eternal future for you. Death. Death is the ultimate enemy, isn't it? Most of you know the story of the Friday back in November. Sarah and I went uh, up to York uh, with some friends just for a weekend away. Uh, we were poking around the, the railway museum, because that's what vicars do. And Sarah got a text 
and I phoned my oldest friend, who was my best man, and his exact words, Shawnee, no one calls me Shawnee, Shawnee, I'm dying. And he didn't last a week. So painful. So painful. Is there life after death? Is there life after death, not just for Jesus, but is there life after death for people like you and me? Verse 2, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? A picture language, of course, this is picture language. My father's house has many rooms. Is this a hotel? No, it's not a hotel. It's a home. I find myself homeless. And I bump into the Prince of Wales. I bump into Prince Charles, as you do. He says, my mother's house has got many rooms. Come and live here. Everything you need will be here. You don't have to bring a toothbrush. You don't have to pay the nightly rate. In fact, no amount of money will ever buy you a room in her house. And I think, but I can't get there. I've got nothing suitable to wear. I I feel completely out of place. The palace is for the great and good, not for homeless me. Why would they let me in? In my mother's house are many rooms. The heir to the throne says to me, I'm going to make sure that everything is placed for you to come and live here. That is the gist of what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, trust me, there is an eternity. Trust me, you will be able to call God Father in the same way that I can. Trust me, I will do everything necessary to get you there. But but we pause for a second and we think, well, what needs to be done? I'm going to do everything necessary to get you there, but what, what needs to be done? What does he need to do to get my room ready? Then we remember it is Thursday evening, And in a few hours' time, Jesus will do what is necessary for me to gain access to the Father. What will he do? He will die on a cross. And the sin that prevents my access to God, the sin that makes me unable to stand in God's presence, will be taken by Jesus. And he will die in my place. He will do everything necessary to unlock the door of my room in my heavenly father's mansion. I'm going, you must trust me. Uh, And then in due course, I will come back, verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Uh, This is not referring to the resurrection in three days' time, but his return at the very end of this present age where there will be a new heaven and a new earth and God will live with his people in a place where there is no more mourning and no more crying and no more pain and no more troubled hearts. Verse 4, you know the way to the place that I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Thomas is in meltdown. Thomas can't think straight. Thomas is in indescribable turmoil. Yes, Thomas, you do know. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. Uh, Jesus isn't saying, I am the way you should live. Live like me and you'll get there. He isn't saying that at all. He's saying, I am the means for you to have eternal life. 
Uh, Prince Charles does not say, well, the way you get to the palace is simply to say, take the same train I take and use the same gate that I walk in. No, that won't get me in because there'll be a big, big guy with a big black hat and a, and a gun and a, and a red who will gently turn me away if I try and do what Prince Charles does. No, Prince Charles would say, I am the means by which you can get in. I have earmarked your room and I have squared it with Her Majesty. You're you're with me. Your entry is guaranteed. I am the way for you to get in. I am the way, the truth and the life. Trust me because I am the way. Trust me because I am the one who is completely true and I am the one appointed by my father to give life. In fact, to know me is to have life. To the disciples, on a Thursday night, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, I'm going, but you must trust me. And we know what happened. They didn't trust him. Uh, Judas may have led his arresters to him, but they all betrayed him. Peter, so sure of himself, didn't even want to know him. Uh, And then Easter morning, uh, the women went to the tomb, not to see if he was alive. They went to tend a grave. Uh, And the disciples on the Sunday evening holed up like frightened rabbits. Those are my words, not John's. Until the moment Jesus walks into the room and he says, peace be with you. And my third heading, I'm alive, you can trust me. The the resurrection changed everything for those disciples. It meant that they weren't followers of a dead man, which is exactly what they were on Friday afternoon. It meant that death need not be the end of someone's life. It meant that Jesus had proved his identity. He'd said, I I am God the Son, and I'm going to prove it by dying in such and such a way and rise on the third day. And then he did it. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. On Thursday, those those were lovely words, albeit words they didn't grasp. But on Sunday, those words were a reality. Jesus had died. Jesus had borne the sin of the world. Jesus had demonstrated the truthfulness of his words. Jesus had life, eternal life. He proved that. And therefore, who could doubt that he was in a position to give life? Uh, On Thursday evening, the message was, I'm going, you must trust me. On Sunday morning, the message was, I'm alive, you can trust me. Well, shortly after Easter, Jesus left earth for the final time before his future return. And he says to people, even people like Peter, who didn't want anything to do with him. And he says to you, I am the way and the truth and the life. I have proved that conclusively by my death and direction, but by my death and resurrection. But you must trust me. Will you trust me? Will you trust me with your fears? Will you pour out your heart to me? Because the resurrection proves that I'm trustworthy. Will you trust me that I really am the only way to the Father? Because the resurrection proves that I'm trustworthy. Will you trust that nothing is going on in your life that I will not bring good out of? Will you trust that nothing is going on 
that's outside of my control. Will you trust me? Because the resurrection proves that I am trustworthy. Will you trust that everything I say is true and, and good? Will you trust that searching out my truth is good and valuable? Will you trust my words in, in all areas of your life? Because the resurrection proves that I am trustworthy. And will you trust that I will give my people true life? You will have my presence with you from the moment you start trusting and one day you will see me face to face. Will you trust that if you give me your life, I will give you a life? The resurrection, it changes everything. Do not let your hearts be troubled by, by all the things that are troubling you. Instead, trust me, says the Lord Jesus because the resurrection proves that I'm trustworthy.